So um, there's so much tension going on in the world, and I didn't get any sleep for the past two nights because I was up watching the elections in the United States, and I just keep thinking about all the conflict that there is, and I have a personal Zen approach to conflict. I really believe that before you have a conflict with someone first, you should walk a kilometer in their shoes. Because then when you have the conflict, you'll be a kilometer away. And you'll have their shoes. So I always like to look at how we can turn negatives into positives. And there is so much negativity about where are we going to be in the future and what's going to be left for us and, and how is it all going and is everything taking all the jobs. And so um, I really want to put everything in some kind of context for you. And to do that first, I have to tell you that before you can really see the future, you have to know that you're not really seeing today. There is something that we call educated incapacity. Educated incapacity. It means knowing so much about what you already know that you're the last to be able to see the future for it differently. It's why we don't go to bankers to find out about the future of banking. We don't go to retailers to find out about the future of retail. We don't go to doctors to find out about the future of healthcare. It is not to condemn any one profession or anybody. I have been studying the future for 50 years and I am more objective than the average person and I still suffer from educated incapacity. Because we begin learning from the time we're born. And what we learn depends upon the era into which we are born, the parents and or guardians we happen to have, the community we happen to be born into, the experiences we have, the schools we happen to go to, the teachers we happen to have, what they choose to teach us or what they've been told to teach us. And that gets added on every single year and then you wake up on a day like this and come to a conference like this and if anyone asked you what your most important assets were, chances are you would list very high, maybe even number one, your knowledge and your experience. And that may be true. They are your most important assets, but they are also the most baggage that you carry around with you every single day. And because it has taken so long and it's been so hard to acquire all that baggage, you think of it as Gucci. So you have all this Gucci baggage that you have piled up. And then what you notice is that someone is running into the future with a backpack. And there goes someone else running into the future with a backpack. And you have a choice to make. Are you going to race into the future with them, with a backpack? Or are you going to justify all of this beautiful Gucci luggage that you've been acquiring all these years? And it is human nature to justify the baggage to say, oh, but it is stronger. Oh, but it lasts longer. Oh, but it has more status. And then there are more and more backpacks heading into the future. And the only two thinking creatures that I can think of that don't suffer from educated incapacity the way that we do are children and aliens from another planet. So the real trick is to try and see things now through the eyes of an alien. And there was a wonderful cartoon that was done many, many years ago by the Canadian Film Board. And it showed two aliens from another planet who were sent to the Earth 
And their job was to watch us very carefully for two weeks, observe us, and then write up a report and send it back to their native planet. So they did. They watched us very carefully for two weeks and they wrote up their report. And their report said that the Earth is inhabited by four-wheeled vehicles called automobiles, and each one owns at least one two-legged slave called a human being. And in the morning, a loud noise goes off and wakes up the human to get itself prepared to take the automobile to a social club, where the automobile hangs out all day with other automobiles, while the human goes into a building to earn an income to support the automobile. And I saw that film, that cartoon, and I thought, you know, there are so many things that if we looked at just a little bit differently, there might be another truth here. There might be something that we're not seeing. And it could be really obvious to someone that doesn't know as much as we know about what we know. And it could be equally true. So we can figure that out quickly just by testing us right now against an alien. I can ask you a few questions and I will make you bets that I'm sure I will win. If I asked you to picture in your mind's eye your workforce, for those of you who here are here in companies, picture your workforce. What are you picturing in your mind's eye? Probably a lot of people who are between the ages of maybe 21 and maybe 65. But are you picturing people who are 13 years old, 12 years old, 15 years old? You should be, because they're the ones who are creating all of the technology that you are suddenly having to use, whether it is social media, or it's anything on the computer, or it's investor ranking sites, created by kids. And how many of you who are in businesses here have advisory boards made up of 15 to 17 year old kids? You don't, because you don't picture them as really being part of your workforce. But they are creating so much of the work that you are now having to do and the way you're doing it. How many of you are picturing people who are over the age of 80, 75 or 80? We know that we're extending life. One in nine baby boomers will likely live to be 100 years old. But the interesting thing is that we're not extending life at the end of life. We're extending life in the middle of life. Today, people who are between the ages of 35 and 70 think of themselves as the same age. Lose a little bit of hair, the market will fix that. Lose a little bit of sex function, the market will fix that. And elastic will take care of everything else. We've never on this planet before had 35 years where people mentally felt that they were the same age. That's never existed before, and that has opened up market opportunities that are manifold. And what do we know about people who are over 65? Nothing. The alien would be laughing at this because the alien would see that the Earth, the industrial world, and parts of the lesser industrial world is increasingly over the age of 60 and 65. It's aging significantly. The only youth parts of the world are India, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Arab Middle East. And the rest of the world is aging significantly, opening up enormous markets for products and services. And we know nothing about it because our market research tends to go in the adult world from 18 to 24, 25 to 29, 30 to 34, 35 to 39, 40 to 44, 45 to 49, 50 to 54, 55 and over. Sometimes 55 to 59, 60 to 64, 65 and over. And that's it. 
And that's crazy to an alien because younger people are more alike. As we age, we become more different from each other. So it's much more important to segment people over 65 to open up whole new businesses and products and services than to be concerned about all those who are much more like each other. If I asked you to picture that workforce, chances are you're picturing physically fit people. The alien would add up all the women who've ever been pregnant, all of those with carpal tunnel syndrome, tennis elbow, runner's knee, migraine headaches, obesity, asthma, diabetes, heart problems, back problems. I could go on and on. The alien knows that the human species is 100% physically challenged. Nobody goes from birth to death without physical disability. What do we know about physical disability? Nothing except for wheelchair access. That's pretty much where we focus. But the fact is that we all know the world is not designed for us, really. Those of us in the audience who are women, we know, because we travel and we're at airports, that if you have luggage, you have to be crazy not to use the handicap stall. Because if you have luggage, you can't get into one of those stalls. And if you do, you ain't ever getting out again. They're not really designed for us. And sometimes you check into a hotel that is so modern and beautiful that the bathroom has lighting that is perfect for a romantic dinner. You can't get your makeup on, you can't shave, but you can have a romantic dinner in there. We don't design for us. We have electronics that if you are over 45, you can't see anything without these. And if anything happens to your remote, you need these and a, and a magnifying glass and a flashlight just to turn that thing on and off. We know it. The opportunities out there just in the world of design to change the products and services and enclosures that we're all involved with, they're just open for the taking. And an alien would see that. Let me ask you this. If I asked you in your mind's eye to picture currency, money, currency, what would you be picturing? Probably government-issued bills, maybe credit cards. Some of you would say, aha, uh -huh, how about cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, yeah? Well, virtual currency is becoming so big in the world that China is very worried about it because it's so much of the currency in China now, virtual currencies from virtual worlds and virtual gaming that they don't know how to control it. And cryptocurrencies are just one subset of virtual currencies and Bitcoin and it, it, Ethereum, all of the others are just subsets of cryptocurrencies. So we have all of that, but the economist, the publication The Economist, about eight years ago, discovered what was the number two currency used in the world behind the US dollar on a daily dollar volume basis. Do you want to try and guess what it is? the second largest currency in circulation in the world behind the US dollar every single day. Reward points. Reward points. Totally liquid in global markets, able to purchase anything, gotten for anything, tradable, usable. And did you know that tweets are currency? There are companies that will give you products and services if you tweet about them. So the world that young people are growing up in, and you heard this earlier today when it came to gold-backed currencies, fiat currencies, and then talking about cryptocurrencies, this world is one where money is funny 
to a lot of young people who will never even know that it was ever backed by anything real. It's any medium of exchange that works. Here's a, another one. Picture in your mind's eye sports and athletes. You got that? Well, an alien would have a very different picture coming down to Earth for the very first time because it turns out that there are many more people on Earth now involved with esports than with regular traditional sports. In esports, the nerds are getting their revenge. They are not physical jocks, and they race each other in virtual gaming environments, in stadiums that hold 30,000 people, with over 35 million people live streaming the events, and awards that are in the million dollar categories, and universities are now recruiting athletes for their esports teams. So all the parents that yelled at their kids for so many years for playing those games are now encouraging them because it will get them a scholarship. And the alien knows that. Picture in your mind's eye nutrition. What are you picturing? Probably some kind of food. An alien would not. An alien would be picturing the sun. Because the single most important source of our nutrition is the sun. And we access that nutrition through different light waves, different parts of the light spectrum. And we get that through different color foods. And that's why nutritionists will tell you to eat the spectrum. But in point of fact, a lot of people in the world who we think are malnourished are really malluminated because they are not eating the true colors of food given to us by the sun. And this gives us an opportunity to think completely differently about how to feed a whole world. What if we completely rethought the kitchen and the refrigerator? And maybe the refrigerator became a light organizing environment in which to grow foods as opposed to where we buy and then store foods. How many senses do we have? How many senses? Most people think five. Some people might say six. Really, an alien would know differently because whatever happened to the sense of speed, the sense of time, the sense of balance, the sense of fear, which is actually a sense, the sense for some of us of direction. There are many other senses and we have, because of educated incapacity, been taught that we have to play a whole piano with just five keys, when in fact we know through brain imaging that we are playing hundreds of pianos simultaneously. That no two moments in our lives are ever alike, ever. You can never repeat the same moment again sensorially. And that opens up enormous opportunities for products and services that pay attention to us as sensory creatures. Where is your brain? Do you know where your brain is? You may point to your head, but an alien would know differently because it turns out that we have a second brain in our gut which has more neurons than our brain in our head. And that's why a lot of people say they have a gut feeling about something. And that's why you're going to see so much more attention being paid in the coming years to the biome, to gut bacteria. That is our second brain, part of our brain system. And because we've never been taught it, we don't know it. And we don't think about the products and the services and the business that grow up and will grow up around that bit of knowledge. Try one more before we go on. I want you to picture sources of energy. What on earth are sources of energy? We know there are fossil fuels. There's wind. There's geothermal. 
hydro, the sun, an alien would laugh at that because an alien knows that everything in the universe is energy. At its base, there is no such thing as solid matter anywhere in the universe. It all comes down to subatomic quantum forms of energy. And there is no reason why your heartbeat shouldn't be able to power up your cell phone. There's no reason why the tiles in the lobby of this building should not have inherent in them the architecture that would allow them to capture the vibrations of all of the people walking on them enough to light this entire building. An alien would laugh at how we do not understand how to capture and utilize energy. It is everywhere for the taking, everywhere. And that will open up so many new businesses in the future, so many opportunities for people to figure out how to capture and use the energy that is everywhere. So the future of work, business, there are thousands now of articles and hundreds of studies, and you've heard some in the past two days, talking about how humans will be put out of work. They always have been, and they always will be, and there's nothing new in that. In fact, the economy has evolved over a very long period of time and we have seen major global fundamental economic transformations before. When we went from the agricultural to the industrial, from the industrial to the post-industrial, the post-industrial to what in the early 90s we called the emotile, to what we now call the metaspace economy. Each one of these transformations had this in common. It was the result of disruptive technologies that came together to create efficiencies. And what does efficiencies mean? It means you can do the same work without labor. And that's how we went from the agricultural to the industrial and so on. We created technologies that put people out of work. But those new technologies created whole new businesses and whole new industries that began to reabsorb the workforce. The second thing that's true about these transformations is that you can no longer make money on what you used to make money on. The profit margins have gone away because of the efficiencies. Some of you may remember the first handheld calculators that came out in the 1970s. Texas Instruments introduced them. They were 1,500 US dollars. Today, you get more computing power in a singing birthday card. Some of you may remember when the first portable telephones came out in the 1990s. You had to be very rich to have one and pretty strong because the batteries required an entire briefcase. Today, we give away cell phones. Give them away for free because it's not the cell phone anymore. It's the new value propositions attached to the cell phone, to the mobile technology. In fact, the fact that we still call it a phone is really interesting because it really is just a mobile. It does a whole lot of other things besides being a phone. In fact, young people don't even want to talk to you on a phone anymore. It's, they don't know how to talk. They don't want to listen to anybody talk. It's all text, pictures, some way of getting around speaking, and we still call it a phone. So disruptive technologies, efficiencies, new industries and new jobs, commoditization, we have to co see what the new value propositions are, where the new businesses, the new industries are gonna be forming. But there's another thing that we have to recognize, and that's why we are in turmoil today 
That's why we see so much of what is going on politically and economically that is disturbing today. And it's because of something we call templosion, the implosion of time. Time is imploding. We were thousands of years in the agricultural. We were 200 in the industrial, 45 in the post-industrial, when in 1992, a lot of the jobs that were supposed to be there for the future, the industries, the companies, were beginning to fail, and the layoffs were in the tens of thousands, whether it was Nippon Telephone and Te Telegraph, ITT, um, Xerox, huge layoffs in the early 90s. And then we knew in 1992, and we even wrote this in the book that we published in 96 from the model that we created in 1992, that somewhere between the years 2005 and 2008, we were going to see massive layoffs again everywhere around the world. Not because we had a crystal ball, but because we knew that if we had thousands of years, 200 years, 45 years, 25 years, how much time do we have until the next one hits? We were lucky if we could make it to 2005 to 2007 before that half-life was there, the new transformation started to take hold and people would be laid off. And economists called it a recession as a result of the high-risk mortgage instruments that collapsed. Well, it wasn't a recession. It never was a recession. It was a major global fundamental transformation that had nothing to do with the mortgage crisis. Nothing. That was a separate financial collapse caused by risky instruments in a technologically tied in global financial market. And that's not what caused the unemployment, but it was used as the excuse for it. And then economists said, well, you know, this is interesting. Um, companies are making a lot of money, so maybe this is like um, a jobless recovery in the reception. Uh, maybe it's a double dip recession. They had no idea what to call this or what they, because they weren't getting it right. It was a fundamental global economic transformation like we've been through before. And because of Templosion, we didn't have the time to figure it out, to move people into new jobs fast enough. And so a lot of people around the world got very scared because the future was coming faster and faster and they were being left behind. And that was throughout the industrial world, the industrialized world. It really left its victims everywhere because now we were in a world where in genetic engineering you could do something in a day or two that used to take nature tens of thousands of years, if not hundreds of thousands of years. Now we knew that in a few short years, the whole Arctic was going to become a shipping lane, the whole Arctic, through transcranial direct stimulation in the brain, something called flow that used to take 30,000 hours to learn could now be learned in two to three hours. The CEOs of the Fortune 1000 companies had lifespans in their jobs, 10 years, of only an average of six years, and that was inflated because of Chinese companies. CEO tenures, if you take out the Chinese companies, had shrunk to 3.5 years. Time was shrinking. Things were happening too fast. So we are now in what we call the metaspace economy, and we call it the metaspace economy because of the 10 value propositions that we've identified that go along with it. And those 10 value propositions are all about some altered aspect of space. I'm going to say them very quickly, then I'm gonna go back and briefly describe them. Don't worry about trying to take this down. It, uh, this is all on our website, The Future Hunters. You can go there, get it for nothing, but I just wanna give you the whole picture right now for what we need to do this afternoon. The 10 value propositions 
are inner space, outer space, cyberspace, microspace, time space, design space, green to blue space, storage space, interspace, and play space. So let's go through those one at a time very quickly. I'm not going to be able to describe them fully, but you'll get the picture. Inner space, and, and by the way, these are where products and services have open opportunity to grow in the future, where businesses can definitely expand and where money is to be made. Inner space is the understanding of what makes living things tick. The planet is living. We know that all flora and fauna are living. We know that all of that, we, we know, for example, that trees have brains, that plants have brains. We know that animals have much higher orders of intelligence, both emotional and cerebral, than had they had ever been given credit for. But I'm only going to spend a few moments now on the human brain and what we are learning. And you heard an entire talk before that should have opened up your mind incredibly about the fact that what we are learning about the human brain is groundbreaking in so many ways and will affect everything from marketing to criminal justice to religion to healthcare and medicine to education. I could go on and on. But knowing what makes us tick is going to be huge, huge for business growth in the future. Outer space. You also saw some things in the presentations about what's happening in outer space. The fact of the matter is that now you can't do anything on Earth without satellites. They run everything from communications to finance to traffic patterns, transportation, entertainment. In fact, if I were to say what I worried more about, if some, someone like North Korea were to decide to use nuclear weapons, it wouldn't be about actually landing on a landmass. It would be blowing up up there in the atmosphere and taking out through EMP, electromagnetic pulsation, the satellites that run everything on Earth. Because by taking that down, you create civil disobedience everywhere because everything collapses. So there is that. There is space exploitation. We will be on asteroids this next year. We have commercial prospects for the moon this next year. And then there is space um, tourism. I think you know that Richard Branson already has a lot of people who've paid a fortune to go up in the first reusable, returnable shuttles to experience just a few moments in space of weightlessness and then they come right back and they're paying half a million bucks for that. But there are already over 200,000 people who have signed up for Elon Musk's first moon, first Mars mission. Over 200,000 qualified people have already signed up. So we know that outer space is going to be very huge and all of the engineering, all of the materials, all of the the excitement, all of the, the movies and the books and everything about it will explode in the coming years. Microspace, several things I would tell you about that. First, you've all heard the term nanotechnology, but I don't know how many of you actually can define it. Nano means billionths of. So a nanosecond is a billionth of a second. And you may think that is extremely fast. But in today's world, we pulse our communications in cycles of six to eight femtoseconds. And a femtosecond is a millionth of a billionth of a second, which makes a nanosecond pretty slow. And a nanometer is a billionth of a meter, which puts it at the molecular level. And we already have so many things working for us at that molecular level. And you've heard a lot about some of them in these earlier talks. We have nanobots that will go through our bodies, our brains, 
that will be used in, in textiles and materials to have things change color, change temperature, change properties. Um, so many things going on there in terms of uh, manufacturing. So in fact, as we talk about manufacturing, you heard about 3D printing and you know that we can 3D print houses and we can 3D print weapons and we are now 3D printing food and we can 3D print animal tissues and replacement parts. But there is also 4D printing and you heard it mentioned once. But 4D printing, the variable is time. So you can 3D print something and over time it will become something else. Either because the material uh, suppose I 3D printed this microphone in a material that if I sent this up in space to the space station and added water, it could become a huge part of the space station. Just expand and grow into that. Or I can print something in origami form, fold it over as I print it, like this paper, and then send it out to a conflict arena and it would be programmed to open up, unfold, and become a huge hospital tent. So over the years when we employ more of this technology, here are some questions. How will we subsidize the shipping industry, which is now basically compensated based on weight and size, when we can make things extremely small? and extremely light, and we're still going to need shipping. And what do we do about security when we have no idea what it is you're carrying in your briefcase or your purse? Because at any future time, it can become something else. So this is a, a whole new world in terms of microspace, and I would just leave you with an acronym here, which we call Bang Fuel. B a-A-N-G-F-U-E-L. And the two A's are important because if you Google bang fuel with one A, you're going to get to some porno sites. So bang fuel stands for bits, atoms, antimatter, neurons, genes, frequencies and vibrations, and ultra and infraspectral energy slash light. I know that sounds like a lot, but the important thing is to remember that it's the combination and recombination of those that are going to create infinite numbers of new materials, infinite numbers of new forms of energy, infinite forms of combination of living and non-living. You know, we've already printed protein. The old child's game of 21 questions used to begin with the question animal, mineral, or vegetable. And in 10 years, that will be an irrelevant question because we won't know what something is. And then we move to cyberspace, which is still in its infancy, in its absolute infancy. And you heard something just before I got on about virtual reality. We are moving out of the world of education, out of the world of education, and into the world of learning. And the two are completely different. I'm asked all the time if the university will survive in the future. In my mind, I think, well, of course it will, because how else will young people learn how to do their own laundry? But I know that the question is really being asked because people think you can now take the most brilliant teacher in the world and put that person on the internet and have that person teach millions of people, not just a few people in a classroom. But the alien would know that that is educated in capacity. Why? Why would you want the most brilliant and entertaining biology teacher teaching you biology on the internet, when through virtual reality gaming immersion, you could become a white blood corpuscle, swim through the bloodstream, fight off all kinds of invading germs, and learn more about immunology in 10 minutes having fun 
than what any teacher could teach you in 20 hours. Why would you want to learn anthropology from someone when you can actually live in ancient civilizations? And you can spend a great deal of time, or not a very little time, however much time you want. But what you will need as teachers go away in the future. You will need them to be replaced by millions more guides that will totally outnumber the numbers of teacher that, teachers that have ever been employed. Because we will be able to explore anything and we will need someone who has known more about this, studied more, and engages with us more about, for example, in those ancient civilizations. I may live in one village for a week and then another village for a week and then a guide will ask me, why do you suppose the pottery is different in those two villages? And that would possibly be because this village was in a desert, this village was in the tropics. Therefore, the pottery would have had to be different. And that's somebody who knows a lot about something that I am now immersed in as opposed to one teacher in front of 30 students teaching them the same thing all the time. If I can visit anywhere in the world, if I can visit anywhere in the universe, if I can go anywhere in history, if I can go anywhere in the future, there will need to be millions of guides who help me understand what I'm looking at. And right now, if you know how Airbnb is moving in its business model, it's actually taking the Uber plus Airbnb kind of approach, and the people who are putting their places up for Airbnb now are becoming tour guides. So that if you stay in their place, they actually take you on a guided tour of everything in that neighborhood and explain it all to you. These opportunities are just opening up like crazy. So cyberspace, we've hardly even touched the surface. Time, time space. The only time we have ever valued time in the economy is the time value of money. Outside of that, we really have not paid much attention to time. But if you ask people today, first of all, we define a luxury as that which is much wanted and in short supply. That to us is the definition of a luxury. If you ask people today what in their lives is much wanted and in short supply, what will they tell you? Time. Time. Then why don't we charge for it? And it defies old economic theory. Out of educated incapacity, we've always said that if it's a luxury, it costs more. But the fact is that if you shop at a Walmart, for your underwear, for your makeup, for your paint, for your kids' toys, for a birthday card. You park in one space, go into one store, buy it all very cheaply, leave after paying at one counter for much less time and much less money than if you went to the higher price stores for all of those things separately. And I could give you another hundred examples of why sometimes we actually pay less and save time, which is a luxury. If you buy a very expensive car, it will take you many years to earn the money for that car. It will take you a lot of time to earn the money to buy the insurance to protect that car. And it will take you a lot of time to earn the income to live in a neighborhood where it's safe to put that car. But if you bought a 2005 beat up old something or other to get you around, you've lost no time, no sleep. Which is a luxury proposition? Which one? And that's why the Ubers of the world are making it happen because they know that young people don't want to own anymore. They don't want to put the time into owning. That's a luxury that that they don't see as worth anything. 
The luxury to them is the time. They just want the access. They just want the access. And so that is opening up whole new businesses and whole new industries. How to leverage unused assets so that access is really the name of the game. And that's even happening in terms of employment. Not only do you see maker spaces for people who want to build things where they can come together and use shared materials, but you find WeWork places, and that's one of the sponsors out there, where so many people can actually share terrific workspace. It's sharing everything. There are people who are actually putting out the fruit that they grow in their backyards because they know they can't eat all of it. So who wants some of it? So time, leveraging time, design space. Design is becoming one of the most important leverageable differentiators in terms of competition. There are people who will tell you that what Apple actually is, is a design company. So design, big, big, green to blue. We know what, this is a spectrum, we know what doing green is. You can't talk about it anymore. You're supposed to do green. You're supposed to recycle. You're not supposed to waste things. You're not supposed to damage the environment, et cetera, et cetera. That's doing green. Being green is very hard because it means that you're leaving no negative footprint in terms of carbon use, water damage, whatever. And that's hard for existing companies or buildings to do or enterprises. You have to kind of start from new to do that. But blue is the future, and blue is where so many jobs are going to be created. And what is blue? Blue is putting back more than you took. How can you possibly do that? I met a social entrepreneur some years ago who buys up blighted, polluted, abandoned industrial properties, mostly in urban areas, and he plants sunflower seeds because sunflowers will grow in any kind of garbage. He winds up with beautiful sunflower meadows. The real estate values around those meadows begin to rise. He employs people to cut the sunflowers and sell them at market. Blue. There are so many blue possibilities out there. There's something called ecotecture, which is that if you can take a tree inside and grow it so that it's no more than nine or 12 inches as a bonsai, then you don't have to manufacture a park bench. You don't have to 3D print a park bench. You can grow a park bench. In fact, you can grow a house from deep-rooted, fast-growing trees that will be more hurricane and flood-resistant than anything that is built on the land. So all of these really exciting imaginary, Im just uh, out of the imagination, storage space, people are running out of room for their garbage, for their stuff, for their, in their brain to store things. We're running out of room to store data. Electronics is the most c uh, polluting industry ever on the face of this planet, and we are running out of room to store electronic waste every day. Perfectly good refrigerators, perfectly good stoves, perfectly good televisions, perfectly good telephones are being thrown away for the next best thing. We used to ship it all to China. Everyone around the world used to ship it to China. China's not taking it anymore. What do we do? How do we store this? So storage space is really huge. Interspace. A lot of people talk about the internet of things. We don't believe that's going to happen. We believe it's going to be the internets of things. There will be other internets. Some of them will not be Western. They will come out of the East. And so the competitive value of organizations you do business with will depend on which internet they are a part of the ecosystem of. So that will open up enormous opportunities. Anytime you can get three things, we call it three plus. Anytime you can get three or more things to talk to each other that never talked to each other before, you have a new business. You have a new value proposition. And then play space. We're learning how important play is, not just to children, but to adults. Play is critical for us. Not only does it help us be creative, but it actually is important for our health and our well-being. 
And so just reimagining how adults can play, just thinking about how we create adult playgrounds out on the street. You want seesaws, you want monkey bars, you don't want to be told that you can't go into parks without kids. So that whole play space concept is there. So there is a lot of opportunity for work in the future. I know about all the millions of people that are going to be put out of work because of self-driving cars, all the, the people who, who rely on the oceans for their business as we really destroy a lot of ocean ecology. But as we move up the chain, the bankers, the doctors, the accountants, and even the coders who are going to be put out of their jobs because th what they know is going on to software. We know about the work displacement, but we also have to know that the imagination that is engulfing us in all of these new possibilities is creating an amazing possibility for the future. Um, whether we're talking about esports or we're talking about big data, big data. Forget about coding, because eventually that too, software will be able to do. But the creative needs in data, we call the future of data smiths. Just as we had blacksmiths and goldsmiths, data smiths, there will be people using data as a profession the way engineering was once created. Because engineering branched out and we had chemical engineering, civil engineering, electrical engineering, and now robotics and rocketry. But with the birth of big data, data smithing is now in the process of being created as a profession. And it too will go down many branches. They're going to be far removed from data analytics and data mining but they're going to be much more creative. There's a new field called computational anthropology, which blends biology, economics, computer science, and physics to answer questions about human behavior. In the future, we will see neuro data smiths, echo data smiths, urban data smiths, socio data smiths, brand data smiths, textile data smiths, entertainment data smiths. The list is endless. So, to summarize, the opportunities for work and for business in front of us are unlimited. Unlimited. The last thing that I want to take you through in the few moments we have left together is that we are going through another second major transformation. Aside from the global economic transformations, Remember I told you that Templosion is collapsing time? Where do we go now? Now that there's no time really left here, where do we go? And we are now on the cusp of entering a new civilization. And there are many ways, there are many sciences that will give you different definitions of civilizations. For example, Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic, there are some who say that we're currently in the Anthropocene age. I want to make it very simple for you. I'm just a kid from Brooklyn, New York. It has to be simple for me so I can explain it to you. So I'm just going to give you four Greek letters. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Delta, difference, is the first appearance of what was human as opposed to non-human on this planet. And depending upon your science, that can take you two million years ago or 150,000 years ago. Gamma, the first harnessing of energy, serious harnessing, harnessing of energy. And that could take you 150,000 years ago from fire to 15,000 years ago to the wheel. Civilization beta, the first large scale accumulations of people and agriculture. And depending upon your belief, your science, that can take you anywhere from 15 to 6,000 years ago to today. We are still in civilization beta, but we are on the cusp of civilization alpha. And that is because we now 
can do three things that we could never do before in human civilization. We can leave this planet, we can destroy this planet, and we can consciously design the many different futures of our own species. And if anyone asks you what the future of humans will look like, you have to answer everything and anything. And you heard all of that in the sessions in the last two days. We have the opportunities between synthetic biology, genetic engineering, artificial intelligence, transplants, implants, surroundables, augmentables. We have the possibility to go in many, many different directions, and we will, and we will. But humanity will survive, and we will be creative enough to know that no matter which direction we go in, the opportunities are endless. I want to remind you of two men who lived at the same time. Both died only recently. One spent many, many years in a prison cell with no technology available whatsoever, nothing. And he emerged to change a nation. And of course, that was Nelson Mandela. The second was entrapped in a body that didn't work, and he was all technology, nothing but technology, and his brain. And of course, that was Stephen Hawking, who went on to change our vision of the universe. So no matter which way we go and how many different directions we go, humanity's creativity will survive. We will be machines and people combining to design, serve, and maintain, and fix machines. We will be machines and people combining to design, serve, maintain, and fix people and other intelligent beings. And we will be a planet that if we can teach our children positive imagination, offers limitless opportunities for them. Thank you.